Much like Western Pennsylvania producing great quarterbacks with the playgrounds in New York perpetuating basketball players, Louisiana has long been a breeding ground for great jockeys. And joining us today on Across the Board is arguably the greatest jockey of all time to come out of Cajun country. Eddie Dalahuse joins us here on Across the Board. Welcome, everybody. I'm Scott Hazelton. With me, as always, every week here on Across the Board, my co-host, Becky Witzman, and the aforementioned one of the greats of all time, Mr. Eddie Delahousse. Welcome to Across the Board, Eddie. Thank you, Scott. Becky, we have a, having me. We have a lot to discuss with you. You've had one heck of a career, a Hall of Fame jockey, and you can get involved in the show as well tonight. If you have any questions, please call on the phones, 1-800-474-9262. And if you don't want to call in, well, we have an email address too, comments at hrtv.com. First question, Eddie. We're going to start right from the beginning. I know you've had a lot, you had a lot of family influence getting involved in horse racing. Who was it in your family that, that got you going? Uh, probably my uncle. Uh, he got me going. He had a son that was a rider. His name was John Delahousie. He rode in the early 50s, and uh, he, he kind of got me started, and uh, I just fell in love with the game. You know, Eddie, we hear a lot, I mean, you yourself, along with some of the other Cajun riders, are described as coming up through what are called bush tracks at a young age. What are bush tracks, and how do they differ from maybe what we see here at Santa Anita and Hollywood Park? Actually, it's uh, people that are farmers, mostly, that uh, have, they match horses on weekends. It might be a Shetland pony, it might be a, a mule, it might be a quarter horse, it might be a thoroughbred, but they get together on weekends and uh, when I was a kid they do it every Saturday and Sunday. And uh, that's how most of the young riders, the riders that came out of Louisiana started back back in those days. Now, unfortunately, I don't think they have any more match rat tracks and uh, it's, it's kind of sad, but uh, Hopefully Evangeline Downs in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana will keep that training center going and maybe some kids might get influenced to go there. And when you were riding in those tracks, at the minor leagues, the bush tracks, are those official mounts or did your apprenticeship not start until you went to a major racetrack? Uh, my apprenticeship didn't start till uh, I went to a major racetrack. Uh, th those days, those those uh, years before I started uh, riding the major racetrack, it was it was a good foundation. But uh, you still had to learn a lot to learn when you started at the major racetracks because mostly it was quarter horse racing. It was just uh, bro break from the gate and go. And uh, now. Uh, when you get to the big tracks, you have to use your head and uh, strategy and the pace, and uh, so it's a little different, but it, it gives you a good foundation. That's the bottom line. For those fans who have heard the name Eddie Delahousse and maybe aren't familiar with all the stuff that you've done, we're going to show you once again. We've got a graphic built, Eddie, of all of the great accomplishments you've had throughout your career, over 39,000 mounts, over 6,300 wins. The list goes on and on, and we'll touch on a lot of these uh, topics on the upcoming uh, 30 minutes that we're spending with you on Across the Board, but back to the your, your experiences, if you will, in the bush tracks. What was the transition like from the bush tracks to the to a mainstream track like like the fairgrounds out there in Louisiana? Well, basically, like, like I was telling Becky and uh, and the fans out there, uh, basically when you you, you change to a major track, it's uh, it's all new because it's you run in five eighths, you run in three quarters, you run in a mile, you're racing. I should I should say you're racing and you have to learn pace. And uh, and pace makes everything for a rider, and that's how you win a lot of races. Uh, knowing your horse and knowing how fast you, you he's going on the year, and uh, when to when to uh, push the button, and uh, you know it's it's a big transition uh, as far as that. But uh, if you're good enough, you'll learn. Was it a gradual transition, or did it just one day click and said, okay, now I know what I got to do? For me, it was a gradual transition. It took me a little while to get going, and. Uh, I wasn't as aggressive as uh, most young riders, so um, it took me a little longer. And once I, it did come, it, it, it was easy after that. How much did it help you with your family involvement? That I know we touched on a little bit, but was that an advantage to you having family in the industry? Well, t true to be known, the family helped, but. Uh, when I started riding, uh, a lot of the family really didn't help, and it was probably the best thing because. Uh, I don't know, maybe they're seeing, well, we, we, we want to help him, but uh, he's not ready, so we'll let him struggle a while, and hopefully he'll pick up on his own, and, and it paid off for me, but uh, they helped a little bit. I can't say they didn't help totally, 
but uh, it, it was still nice to have them in the corner a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You first broke through in, through into the mainstream into the fairgrounds in 1967, and then about a year later or so, 1968, your first win at Evangeline Downs at a recognizable track. What do you recall from that first win? Well, ironically, uh, the horse that I broke my maiden on. Uh, Another rider was supposed to be riding him that day, and the horse was a rogue. Um, by me, by me saying a rogue is it was a horse that was very hard to ride, and uh, this jock didn't like him, and he was scared to death of him. And uh, I was apprentice, dumb, didn't know any different. So I figured, you know, hey, I'll ride him. So, and that's how I got my first winner by riding some crazy horse, <laughs> going to the gate, and he'd lunge, he'd do all kind of stuff. But we got once he got in the gate, he ran great that day, and I won four or five races on him after that. We're going to stick with the Cajun theme, Eddie, and we've got an email checking in from one of your fans out there in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, Jeff wants to know, or is checking in and, and telling you, I've been a longtime fan of Cajun riders. Eddie D., you are at the top of my list, but it's great to see the success of Calvin Burrell and Robbie Alvarado and young Joe Talamo. Just, just touch on those guys. What's it like to see all these young guys coming up in the great success coming out of Louisiana? Well, you know, you talk about these guys, but there have been other guys before them uh, that you know, Randy Romero, Craig Perrette, and many others uh, who, uh, that have come out of that. But these these three guys have, have Calvin, I've, I rode with his brother Cecil when I first started. So I knew him and uh, I was so happy to see Calvin win the Derby because he's a hard worker and he's dedicated his life to racing. And it was, it was great to see him win the, the Derby. And Robbie, he's another great guy, another outstanding rider, and and uh, he's, you know, to see him come and win the Preakness, I'd have loved to see Calvin win the the, the Preakness to, to have a, a a triple crown chance for, for a horse this year, but it didn't happen, so it, I was very happy for Robbie. And uh, it, it's, it's just great watching those guys win and and knowing where they come from, and uh, the hard workers, and and that, and then now I touch on Joe Talamo. He's a young, 17-year-old rider, apprentice that has all the talent in the world, and I've met him a couple of times, and uh, I've had him over to my house uh, here in Arcadia, and I met his family, and they're a great family, and the guy that helped him uh, get started, his name's Connie to sit to Connie to Sistro, and Connie. Uh, Ironically, I won about a hundred and something races for Connie when I was riding in Louisiana. So he came under a good guy, good mentor. And if Joe just keeps his head on his shoulder, I think you'll have an, another top Cajun rider. Although Joe's not a Cajun. He's from New Orleans, Louisiana. So that's not so a Cajun. he's not a Cajun. What do you have to be to be a Cajun? You gotta be in there, Lafayette and uh, New Iberia and Opelousas and those those areas. Uh, like Ray Sabil, he's from Sunset, Louisiana. That's Cajun country. But Joe <laughs> is from New Orleans. <laughs> All right, we won't call okay. him Cajun, but it he's is not a <laughs> Cajun. But he's 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 a hell of a young rider, and hopefully. Uh, He'll continue doing well after he loses his apprenticeship, and I don't see why not because he has all the makings of a top rider. It is a common thread. Mark Guidry, Ken DeSormo, and the, just the Louisiana background. What in your mind, what is it about Louisiana that makes these riders so productive on the racetracks? Well, I, I, I think it's they come from a rural area, and it's all people that love horses and that have horses. Like I said earlier, they can have a mule, a Shetland pony. In those days, they were matching races, but they love racing. And the, the kids, the kids, they just love the excitement and love the challenge. And most of, the, most of their dads, just like Ken's dad, uh, DeZomo, his dad had horses. You know, my dad had horses. Uh, Robbie's dad, I don't know if he had horses, but I'm pretty sure he did. Or someone in the family had horses, so it's all a fan, uh, horse, horse people, horse related. So it makes a big difference uh, in that area, being from that area to where horses are. Well, you among guys like Mark Guidry, Robbie Alvarado, now Calvin Burrell, really have given somebody, somebody for uh, to look up to. And was there anybody that you got a chance to look up to? Or was there any person, particularly when you were growing up, or were you one of the like originals that come out of Louisiana? No, that was a that was a rider there named uh, Ray Broussard. And Ray, he had weight problem, but he was a great rider. And uh, everybody in Louisiana knew him, and I, a lot of he rode in New York a lot. But uh, I, 
I just watched him ride, and I picked up so much by watching him, and, and I, I had a chance to ride with him as he got older, and uh, I learned so much from him, and it benefited me uh, in those years. Eddie, we've got a, a phone call coming in from Louisiana. Kenneth is joining us here on Across the Board. Ken, what's your uh, question for Eddie D? Eddie D. Brown Shield and Estes. I was brushing him when you broke his maiden. So so you were one of the grooms that were taken care of, my huh, Ken? Eddie D, I was Kenneth Derwan. I got you your uh, picture home. Oh, it's Kenneth Derwan. I know Kenneth. Yeah, <laughs> hi, Kenneth. How you been? Uh, man, I was All just right, watching brother. you. I just went to call you hi and ask you about the old horse, Uncle Clint. He'd have been a bad one to done ride. Yeah, he would have <laughs> been a bad one. You're right, Derek. Uh, Ken, how's, how's things going? How's the family? Everything's going good. Uh, Ralph's doing good at the Garden Star Ball and Crabs. Everybody from the track's coming around. Well, tell so everybody we hello. just wanted to tell you hi. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for calling. All right, buddy. Take care. Ken checking in from Louisiana. That's that's kind of the, the sense that we get in the racing world. I mean, we, it's such a big family, and you moved from Louisiana out to Southern California. How was the how hard was the transition to go from your your hometown from the Midwest, where you kind of knew everybody, out to kind of a I mean, obviously a brand new world out here in Southern California. Well, it was a, a, a big transition because a lot of people. Uh, uh, they were advising me not to come out and they said you're doing great here why should you want to go out there and I thought I achieved all I could achieve in the Midwest and in the South and I I wanted to take a challenge I wanted to take a chance in my life to uh, see if I could make it and uh, I and I, although at that time my daughter was young and she was I have a handicapped daughter now she's 31 years old and the schools were better here for her and the opportunity of just staying in one place instead of, as you know <laughs> when you're in the Midwest or in the South you have to travel a lot mm -hmm. and it's from this racetrack to this racetrack well here in California you pretty much stay in one area so it it, it benefited me sure I was afraid to come but I had to take a chance and it paid off it, it most certainly you did know. you know Eddie we talked a little bit about the jockeys that have come up through Louisiana and such but now you know we have a new program Chris McCarron has started a jockey school that's giving a chance for a lot of young people to get into racing and really learn to be a rider, and I know you're involved. Tell us a little bit about the jockey school and how people can get involved. Well, you know, I was there a couple of weeks ago, and I, I had not never observed it, and uh, they have a great program. It's a program that's uh, based at uh, the training center in Lexington, Kentucky, and Chris has a, a mile track he can work with. They have stalls, and they have a, a great grass uh, track, uh, not a track, but uh, a, a place where the kids can go. It's probably 10 acres, and they can go on the grass and just piddle around and enjoy, race, uh, enjoy the horses and feel them out. And they groom the horses, they, they walk them, they do everything. They start from the bottom and they work off and they clean their tack. And uh, it's a great program and it's, it's also a program that I think the University of Kentucky is, is sponsoring. And uh, you get credits. If you go to the University of Kentucky, you can get this program and uh, you get credits through there, through them. Is it something too that maybe somebody who hasn't grown up in racing and around the horses, it's something that they can get an equal benefit out of? Absolutely. Uh, Louis Harrigy, which Louis is from uh, California, he met a, if I'm not mistaken, he met a young man in Glendora, and he talked him into going to Chris's school. Good. And I've watched this young man for the two days I, would, I was there, and he looks great on a horse, and he had not, never been around horses before, so it, it's a big plus. It's a big plus. So. All you youngsters out there that wants to get involved in racing, uh, I think you should uh, call Mr. McCarron and uh, see if you can get uh, enrolled into the school. And uh, it's a big benefit. We've never had this before in the United States, and it's a great program. So I, I think it would benefit all you youngsters, and uh, you'd learn the right way. And not only riding, it's learning finances teaching you about finances. Some of the things that you maybe just yeah. life lessons you don't know. Right, would, right. How to be a to class expect. act. Yeah. <laughs> much well, like that. Trying much to, like Eddie. Trying to keep exactly. you in line, you know, and try to teach you the right way. And if you want to uh, really be successful, this would be a great school to go to. Eddie Delahousse joining us here on the Across the Board. And when HRTV's presentation of Across the Board returns, the great jockeys come with great horses. And Eddie D rode some of the best, including that one. AP and D, more with Eddie, Dooley, Eddie Delahousse when we get back.
moving for the stretch. Sonny's halo on the inside has his head in front. Desert Wine is second. Highland Park still right there. Now coming up on the outside and gaining ground, slew of gold. Marfa on the extreme outside. Down the stretch, it's Sonny's halo on the inside. Desert Wine is second. On the outside, Marfa. Up between horses, slew of gold in play, fellow. They're nearing the finish. It's Sonny's halo. He's going to win it. Sonny's halo wins it a length and a half. Photo for second. I think Desert Wine may have held on. And here he is. And let's tell them the little anecdote of you and Shu and Lafitte Pinkai and Sandy Hawley in that restaurant in the Westwood section of Los Angeles last Sunday night and what you said you were going to do. Well, I said I, I was hoping to try to win two this year, make it two this year. Said and it was the dream of your life, right. didn't you? That's right. And this has to be the greatest day of your oh, life. Oh, it's the greatest day of my life, Mr. Cosell. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I still can't believe it. Two. Eddie, you had to work like a dog to bring Gato Del Sol up a year ago. But here, your whole ride seemed so confident, so controlling. Was it, in fact, that way? I was really confident, and I wasn't nervous. I, I came in this race probably less nervous than last year. And uh, when I went around that turn and I was laying second and my horse was relaxed so good, I said, well, I think we're on our way. For one brief flashing instant, and this is the last question, Eddie, does it whine? nudged his head ahead but you knew you could recapture instantly didn't yeah, you? yes uh, he he got ahead of me but i i knew i had a lot of horse left and mm -hmm. i knew i i waited till the eight pole and when i asked him he just took off you're a great rider Thank under you, publicized and hartak called it all of the way congratulations you. to you my friend Thank you. 24 years ago, first Saturday in May, 1983, Eddie De La Husse and Sonny's Halo and being questions by the great uh, Howard Cosell. And you, the honesty finally comes out. You really didn't know what the heck he was talking about when he asked Not the question. Not at all. I was in somewhere else. I mean, I was so excited <laughs> back in those days. And at that time, you know, it, it was just actually two in a row. But, uh, but it was just wasn't even thinking about two in a row. I didn't know what I was thinking. I didn't know what to say. But anyway, whatever came out, came out, and I won the Derby. But I was I was very fortunate that year winning that Derby because the, the year before I was riding a champion two-year-old, his name was Roving Boy here in California, and he was champion two-year-old in the country. Ironically, I picked up through Craig O'Brien, my agent at the time, uh, Sonny's Halo was a champion two-year-old in Canada. I didn't know it when Craig picked up the horse you know and he said Eddie this horse can run if we can ride him I said let's go for it and ironically we were supposed to go ride him in the rebel and I, I had a I had a commitment and I couldn't go and I said well we lost that mount well that's gonna lead us right up to our next email question Eddie. Right. And, we, and we've got uh, Mark from Nashville Tennessee he's got an email for you what do you remember most about your first Kentucky Derby win with uh, Gatto Del Sol in 82 well as far as Gatto uh, he, he, I was riding him all along for Eddie Gregson and uh, we won the Del Mar Futurity and we won a couple of other races and uh, he ran second in the Bluegrass. And when I rode him in the Bluegrass, I told Eddie, I said, look, I rode in Kentucky for quite a few years and this horse handled this track. I think we might back into something in the Derby. I think we've got a great chance. And uh, when everybody said, you know, well, you have the auxiliary gate, I said, his style of race r running, it w won't make any difference. And it didn't. It worked out perfect for us. And he probably ran the best race of his life that day, and I was happy for it because uh, there again, you know, you, you at the head of the stretch, you're thinking, well, I'm going to win me a derby. Uh, and it's just one of those things that goes through your head. I'm going to... I'm going to win the Derby, and I'm going to be in the history book. <laughs> and they can't take that away from me. Eddie, what you I'm going to ask you is along that same lines, because when I get excited about something, you get weak, and you get weak in the knees. How do you keep your emotion from overcoming yourself coming down the stretch? Well, you know me, I'm a guy, I've, I've always held a lot of stuff in. And even the Derby that day, I didn't go crazy or nothing. I saluted, you know, I picked my whip up. And, but compared to Calvin Borrell, I was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Calvin was the greatest. Uh, he showed really emotion this year, mm -hmm. a lot of emotion. And uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm more excited now than probably when I was uh, when I did it that day. 
you know, still is it just look back on it. The yeah. retrospect, yes. you realize what you did? Yes. Well, you know, one at the only... time, you know, it, you don't hit, it doesn't hit you, you know, and it's later on in years it does. Mm -hmm. And it's something, like I said earlier, it's something in the history books. and uh, They can never take it away they from They can't you. take it away. And one another thing they can never take away from you, you only one of four jockeys to go back to back in the Kentucky Derby, and that's something else. And you also got a chance to complete the career triple crown, if you will, in 1988 with Risen Star. You won the Preakness. You won the Belmont. What happened? in the Kentucky Derby? Well, I think I, I think Louis took the speed away from him uh, uh, when he ran in the Derby. I, I think they trained him too hard. That's my opinion. Because uh, the Belmont, in the Belmont and this race, they gave him some pretty sharp works, three-eighths of a mile. In fact, for the Belmont, the day before, he worked uh, three-eighths of a mile in 33 and change. But in the Derby, he worked him a, quite a few long works and took a lot of the speed away. And I think we'd have had a Triple Crown winner if that wouldn't happen. But it's passed. We won the Preakness and we won the Belmont and we didn't win the Derby and we'll never know but uh, at least I had the chance to win the Preakness and the Belmont. One of been many nice near the, misses. Yes. <laughs> Another horse. And it's continuing since how many? It's, it's a disease. It's what, contagious. Years? <laughs> Something like Something that. Like it just keeps on going right along. And another horse yeah. that I think a lot of people think uh, maybe should have won the Triple Crown back in 92. That was uh, AP Indian Roman from Illinois. He's uh, checking in here to Across the Board. Roman, welcome to Across the Board. You're live with Eddie Delahousse. How you doing, Scott? Becky and Eddie. Uh, first, I'd like to say, Eddie, you were probably the best jock and on, on the closer I've ever seen in my life. Well, and uh, we all know uh, AP Andy. He's a great sire. He was even greater on a racetrack. And I re recently read in the publication that you uh, stated to several uh, family members that uh, you actually thought he would win the Triple Crown that year. Yeah, I thought he would. Uh, he was that kind of horse. I mean, we won the Santa Anita Derby with him, and it looks like it looked like we were just gonna go right on up down the up up the line. But unfortunately, you know, he had uh, feet problem, and uh, he, and Neil Drysdale done a great job with him holding him together. But unfortunately, you know, we, he couldn't hold him together for the Kentucky Derby. But I think he done the right thing not running him because he protected the horse for later on in that year, and uh, it paid off. He won the Belmont, and then he won the Breeders' Cup Classic. You know, and as good as he was on the track, Eddie, he's done some great things in the breeding shed, stands at Lane's End now. And, and you yourself, you're involved now with some bloodstock. What does he pass on to his, his offspring? Well, he, he has he has tacked all his off springs. They, 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 he has they show speed and they have the stamina, and that's what he's showing. And uh, just like the filly rags to riches, uh, she's not a bay, but uh, she's chestnut. And, but she runs something like he did. I mean, she's got tactical speed, and when you want to push the button, she goes. And many other stallions, he, 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 and many other horses, he, his prodigies, he's passed on, are, are kind of like him. You know, they have that, that they have that want to win style. And as we're looking at uh, the Belmont winner here, rags to riches, you can see that in her. She certainly is a good one, and AP Indy was no doubt. Seattle slew on the top side, Secretary on the bottom side. I mean, with breeding, it really doesn't get much better. He's well worth the $300,000 in which he stands at Lane's End for, and he has proven it to this, uh, us to that. Is, is he the best horse you've ever rode, Eddie? He's the best horse I've ever rode, and probably the best bred horse I've ever rode to achieve what he's achieved. And, and like you said, he's proven that being a, such a sire. So uh, sometimes you breathe to the best, and, and then you hope for the best, but it, it, the best came out in him. You're going to keep looking at AP Indy, and he's coming from off the pace. And Roman brought up a good point, I think, in his question. He talked about your patience. Your patience, it was so important as a jockey. And there was times that he'd watch you and think you weren't ever going to get there. How did you ever get the timing right? Well, it's just that that's one thing a rider, riders, I think that are in the top ten in this country and and over the years that have ridden the top riders, you learn the feel and you learn what you have under you and uh, it gives you confidence. You know when to move and you know what you have under you so it's going to pay off uh, for you winning races. Just like him winning the British Cup Classic, everybody said, well, you didn't you didn't use the whip on him. I didn't have to. His momentum was carrying carrying me, and I knew if anybody else was going to beat him, they would have had to have been a super horse well, that day. Let's let's stay on the whip theme. You've won seven Breeders' <laughs> Cup uh, races, and what comes to mind when I say whip in the Breeders' Cup? 
Well, well you know. Dropping a whip, maybe? Dropping a whip. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> Hollywood Rock. How about your memory, Now, right? you see, that that race itself, right there, I probably should have never uncocked my stick. But for, for to, to be truthful, I kind of lost my composure. <laughs> when, and when I lost my whip, I really like lost my composure. <laughs> But she was a great filly to ride. There it went, and I went to screaming, yelling, throwing the reins, and uh, hitting her on the shoulder with my hand. How but she still got there. With, with Passiana, she was the one on the outside. I mean, really, did you think that she was going to get you, and that could have been a costly mistake? Well, when I lost that whip, I thought, I thought, sure, I said, oh, God, she's going to get me now. But the filly, she was so great, she just kept digging in. She carried me to the wire, so Oop, there it, went. it wasn't so much me winning on I won on her, but she, she helped me win. Did your heart just immediately drop to your stomach when that happened? Uh, I lost my composure. I, I, I'm telling you the truth. I lost my composure at that point. What happened it to the whip? Just, I don't know. I don't know if they ever found it. I don't remember. I didn't care. As long as they put the sign official, then I was relieved. You got the Breeders' yeah, Cup trophy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Eddie Delahousse, we thank you so much for taking out the time here on Across the Board. You're one of the class acts in racing, one of the greatest of all time, and we wish you success in whatever you uh, look forward to doing in the rest of your life. Thank you, Scott. North back American in thank HR you. TV. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, anytime. all the best. We you love are you. welcome back anytime you want. Eddie Delahousse, thank you. for Eddie, Becky, I'm Scott.